views and opinions of any of the guests of After Hours AM are not necessarily the views and opinions of After Hours AM, its hosts, its staff, or any of its affiliates. Broadcasting live from the After Hours AM studio, Joel Sturgis. Welcome to this edition of After Hours AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis. Right along with me is Mr. Michael O'Neill. Oh, Michael, Michael, Michael. We are here to shower you with a warm golden shower of positivity. Just relax, close your eyes, because we want to be your refuge from the negative. Right, Mike? Right? Wow. Right. You you dared so I, me, you dared me to lead with that, Mike. I did, um, and I did. But the way you the way you phrased it, it sounded like we were you in the audience, and you were here to shower me. No, no with positivity, no. and that was incorrect. No, we're if here. you were here, it would it would it would be yeah. Never mind. <laughs> no, no, never 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 mind. I meant the audience. They that I Who? love these people. Uh, well, of course, they're awesome. We have the best audience ever. And we have a lot of your stories coming up this hour. Uh, again, you guys just keep on bringing it, and we, we'll keep reading it. And we really love all the stories, all the interaction. But i got to ask you, Mike, how are you doing with uh, your little quarantine thing going on on your end? Are, are, are you doing well? Are you, or self-isolation, I should call it. And yeah, your social distancing. How, how are you doing? I'm doing wonderful with social distancing. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm actually good. Um, it's been a little over three weeks now since I started this thing. I've only been out less than a handful okay, of times yeah, at the grocery store. I'm going to let you guys what? in a little bit. I'm going to tell you why it's so easy, Mike, for Mike to do the social distancing. Because he nev- <laughs> never left his house to begin with, hardly. So for yeah, him, exactly. he's like, nothing's changed, man. I, I, I didn't even know anything was going on. Well, I definitely knew things were going on. Thank I mean, you very I mean, much. He, 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 he still, ever since the van incident when he was a kid, he stays away from people anyway. Oh, Lord. So, so you know, you know, I, I don't blame you. I mean, we, we love you, man. We're here for you. You're, you're here you're, for you. You're, make, you're making things up. I am making things up. I, I don't, as I go. I don't. Well, now, in your defense, which is odd because you were, like, attacking me, but uh, I'm gonna, so I'm going to defend you. Sure. Um, the the not leaving the house part was actually pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, I, I just I don't particularly have um for the last well for the last two years until Halloween this past year I worked nights mm-hmm. you know overnight so I never saw anybody anyways I slept during the day worked during the night um so even on weekends you know it's three in the morning and I'm like man I got nothing to do because nobody's up yeah um. So when this quarantine thing came, it's like, oh, what? I got to go into my theater room and watch Netflix? <laughs> well, and get, and possibly, can't. potentially get paid to do it? Really? Yeah. How do I get, how do I get paid to watch Netflix? Well, you, you, don't, you, know, you haven't heard the news yet. Do you live under no. a rock? I mean, no, but oh. maybe it's not my news. <laughs> well, well, what, what, what I'm saying is they allegedly... And I hope this is true. Are sending us all money to oh to the s- government? I thought you meant yeah. Netflix. No, not Netflix. Money. They just want to take your money. No, 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 <laughs> no, not that's Netflix. What worried me? No, no. If Netflix paid me to watch Netflix. I don't know if I could. There isn't enough good content on there for me to keep me there. Take a nap. You know, all the, all they yeah, need yeah, to see is that you're you're streaming it. Yeah. So actually, what I've been watching is a lot of uh, Amazon because I was hooked on the Hunter's show. Have you seen that one yet with Al Pacino? No. No. you got to check it out. It is it is pretty damn good. It's real good. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah, it, it's all about... I like it. Nazi, it's all about Nazi hunters. Well, yeah, yes, but you'd have to watch it. It's, it's too 
nuanced for me to explain to you everything. But yes, <laughs> it is about Nazi hunters. But it's definitely worth your time. I mean, it's not like you're going anywhere. No, but I haven't gotten that far yet. See, I just, I just hooked up um, my eight bit Nintendo oh. to to my to, uh, my desk bit. here. Oh my god! You're yeah, the original like, the, like I, an I, old school Nintendo, like the real old school one, not real, the, not the classic re release. That's but correct. The one that we had to blow in and make work, and we would. You know, scream yeah. and yell at, and the, the buttons would hurt our hands, along with that sharp-edged controller that did everything but ensure you get carpal tunnel. That Nintendo? Well, that Nintendo, And but the thing is, is that I was so big into Nintendo back then, and I know nobody will be able to see this except you, Joel, but I actually have the NES Advantage, oh which is like the, the, huge, the huge controller. So, so you've owned this um, since you were a kid, right? Like, um, is this... I got an... Original. I got the Nintendo Christmas um, the year I turned five. And this is the Nintendo? I do. I believe so. <laughs> Pretty sure. Wow. So <laughs> you've I, had I this. the actual NES Advantage. You've but. had this Nintendo, this beautiful piece of vintage gaming hardware, this yes. model since you were five years old? Yes. That is amazing. You must works. hold on to stuff like no one's business. No, uh, it it actually disappeared for a lot of years, and then I believe my sister found it in a box one time when we were moving some stuff, um, and then she had it for a couple years, and then I think she moved to the point where she she couldn't fit it anymore. Like she didn't have maybe the TVs, and so she was like, "Do you want it?" I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> and, yes, and please." I, I've, I've had I've had it ever since, and. Um, but the thing about it is, is unless you, you none of the new TVs will play you need it. a CRT, you need an actual CRT TV, an old school tube TV. Um, you don't actually, if you want to use like the cable thing that actually screwed in and then the cable went, went through it, yeah. you do. Um, but if you use the AV, AV cables, you know, the red and the, the, Sure. The red and the yellow sure. and the white gotcha. little things, you can hook it up. Like I, I have a I have a forty eight inch Sony TV. That's probably it's less than ten years old. It's LCD. Um, it it works on it. And I had a Samsung that's probably only four years old. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, a friend of mine kind of wore it out, but it worked on that too. So if you use the AV cables, you can make an 8-bit Nintendo work on a newer TV, wow, not a 4K. Just, this is just us nerding out right over here, Talk about Nintendo. Oh, what um, no, I, oh, yeah. yeah. I used to love Nintendo back in the day. Uh, it, it also, it's making a big comeback, Nintendo is, and especially the old hardware if you can find it. And it's going for gold right now. I mean, to find a pristine example of the original run, it's, it's not cheap to get. But a lot of it, too, is it reminds us of a simpler time. You oh, know, when yeah. we were kids and things weren't so complicated and the world wasn't so chaotic. So my hats is off to you, my friend. C Keeping can, the dream can you alive. Imagine, well, my pleasure, and, and I will. But can you imagine um, how, like, a Gen Z person that's playing Call of Duty would would do with Contra? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, you know, I'm... What am I supposed to do? What are okay. what are the codes? Let me have well, a nerd there's only moment. one. Give me yes, okay. the Konami code. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. B A B A wow. select start. You want two players. Wow. That's right. And that he, guy just died too. I'm he, so upset he, he about that. It. Well, tomorrow means that we're talking about video games. A big release is coming out. The remake of Resident Evil three is coming out. Did you ever play the Resident Evil games? When no. no. Not one time. No. No, not one time. Is on there any plat on any really? any format? So you're yeah. not into the scary survival horror genre of video game? Oh uh, no, th no, that's not that's not completely true. I guess I don't have a lot of. I never had a lot of opportunity. Like it just never appealed to me. But I, I know that when I think it was the Sega. Sega Genesis came out. They had a, uh, 
game called Dracula, and that was actually a pretty cool game. And I love Castlevania. Yeah, <laughs> I have a PlayStation I, Four. Of course and, you do, and an Xbox One. Thank you, both uh-huh. courtesy sent to me. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> and I, I do enjoy both those things to some extent. I I do. In some ways, I <clears throat> miss the old video game stuff. I used to do a lot of game reviews for radio. You play a game, you do a review on it and stuff like that. And I found that to be not as entertaining when you're playing it for pure just having fun. You know, when you do it for your job, it sucks. But when you can just relax and play the game and lose yourself in it, that's when it's the best. By far. Yeah. And those 8 bit mm-hmm. games, they offered that better, in my opinion, than a lot of the newer titles. Just yeah. simple. You just uh, turn it on and play. So, for the past week, it was day seven today, um, uh, for an hour, uh, starting at 1 30 p.m., I've been doing Facebook Lives. You know, just as my way of being like, hey, here's an hour for people stuck at home to come and watch me ramble for an hour. And it's kind of like this. But today, it was really, really, uh, I don't want to say it was slow, like nobody was watching, but nobody was interacting, at least not to the point where it could keep me going. So I literally took my webcam, put it on top of a bunch of games, and turned it around so it was facing my TV, and then I had everybody watch me play Paperboy. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a platform called Twitch that I've been told about that people – pay money to watch another person play a video game. Yeah. It's it's like the nerd version of a cam girl. Y- yeah. And, and I couldn't believe that, that someone <laughs> would pay to watch someone play a video game. But I was schooled by my 12, 13 year old son now about, uh-huh. you know, the nuances of what the Twitch is. I thought it was because you have epilepsy. Yeah. But no, it, it's actually it stream because he was talking about getting some Twitch on. I'm like, wow, I don't know what you're talking about, kid. No idea, no idea. <laughs> just, just wear protection, my friend. <laughs> that's that's right. Yeah, you know, we we need to have a talk then, son. Come here before you go twitching. We haven't even, <laughs> we haven't even talked yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, that's the thing. You know, all that old stuff is coming new again. I I own, I'd say a thousand movies, DVDs. And I've been trying to, in my time of social isolation, I'm going to try to watch every single DVD I own. That's disgusting. I'm going to try. I'm gonna That's try. like gluttony. That is gluttony. <laughs> it is. It is, but it's keeping my sanity going. And it's. I've been lending movies out to people that don't have entertainment options as well, helping them out. Stuff like that, just tr- just trying to help everyone around me as well. And I know a lot of the emails we got that I didn't include for the show are on the sad side. We we get it. We're there with you. We're we're all we're all struggling through this, and we're all scared of this. And 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 we care about you guys, and we want you guys to come through this as good as possible. And if there's anything that we can do, if, if if you are really lonely and you need to reach out, give us a shout. We'll talk with you. Hell, mm-hmm. give me your number. I'll give you a call. You, you know, if you just need somebody to talk to just for a couple minutes. I know Mike's skeptical over there. He's he's skeptical in human beings, but I no, 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 I'm not. I'm not. I'm not skeptical. Just don't know what a phone call with me would really well, do to you know maybe they'll feel their... better maybe it's one of those deals of you don't know how good you have it till you hear someone else talk well that that is true because after the valentine's day show <laughs> that I, I made my um my grand my grand entrance a lot of people from what i understand wrote in be like man i thought my life sucked wow so I mean, it's the least that I can do well, for people. Yeah, yeah, but that was fun because that was pre-COVID-19 here. Think about that. That was just February. That was not that long that ago. Was, no, no, it wasn't. And, and it wasn't even At really all. a thing here yet. We knew about it. It was brewing. I know we have to talk about it a little bit. We discussed it before the show. We're going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about it. But I think what we should talk about is the positive things that are happening. The positive things. People are helping each other. I mean, I've never seen yeah. so many people help each other. I've never seen so many people be there for each other. 
and that mm-hmm. that's inspiring. You, you know, look yeah. At, look I mean, at, and, and it's, it's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, and and there are a lot of people um, who have a lot of money or have phenomenal homes. You know, I'm talking about like actors and actresses and um, you know CEOs and all this stuff, and, and they could easily just go in their house and have absolutely the the, the grandest ball of uh, of the time yeah. out of all of us for this entire thing and, and not even care. But I mean, you have people, um, you have late night hosts and whatnot that are doing it from their, you know, from the garages and their basements. And you have actors like, uh, John Krasinski. Uh, he's doing, um, he's a thing called some good news. And he, um, you know, he's taking some good news from people and, uh, he's doing like, a, I think a U- I think it's on YouTube. But I know, like he just had um, Steve Carell on, and they they talked about memories from the office for I, I don't know how long it was. I mm-hmm. honestly didn't even watch. I should have, but because uh, I love that show, I was just watching it today actually. But um, I know Stephen Amell, who used to be um, the Arrow um, on the CW, he's had something almost every day on his Instagram um, uh, interviews and stuff with with cast members. So, I mean, there are a lot of people who don't have to do it uh, that are, are, are trying to make this as easy for everybody as they can, you know, because they're in it with us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so true. There's a lot of good coming out of this. I know that the news is nothing but negative. You flip the news on, it's a half hour of this is what's wrong. Once in a while, you'll get that little bit, that blurb of positivity. But there's a lot more positive than negative right now. I think you mean that the other way around. <laughs> there's a lot more negative than positive. Oh, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> ah, sorry about that. My mind is, uh, I'm actually staring at our numbers here and uh, watching the encoder shoot out to our various radio stations. And, and it's almost we hypnotic We have, like, four people. There. We have, uh, well, three and a half. Three and a half. There's three and a half dog, people? Well, there's a dog listening somewhere. So that's where the half comes from. But tonight we have a great show lined up for you guys. Now we're through that little bit. We love you all, and we're here with you. We're all quarantined or or self-isolating with you, and we are your friends. We're one of you. We're doing the same things you're doing. We're just trying to keep our own spirits up. But let's give you two hours that maybe we can all forget about it for a minute. Tonight we have Michelle Bellinger on the show. So and that's, that. that's going to be a lot of fun. That'll be top of next hour. You're going to want to tune in for that. She's been a paranormal state. She's been all over the TV portals to hell. Great interview. And I, I've never talked with her before, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I like getting people with different points of view on the show, too, because she has a different point of view on a lot of things. Yes. Like, I'm not really big on vampires, right? I mean, I, I respect them. I know them. I understand some of the culture. We've done shows on them. But she is actually someone that is ingrained in a lot of ways into that culture as well. So we can talk with her about vampires, talk about paranormal. She does goes anywhere we want to go, so it'll be a lot of fun for open just to sit down and listen. And that being said, let's get into your stories, the stuff that you wrote about to us that you want to hear us talk about. With no further ado, I will kick this thing off. Hey guys, Lenny here. Here's my story. So, for context, my great grandpa on my dad's side was a total badass. Yeah! He was there at Normandy on D Day. Oh my god, I guess he is. If anyone can do that, my hats are off to you. Thank you for your service. But then his entire platoon was blown to pieces during that battle. He was dragged away to a German POW camp and pronounced dead when his dog tags were found in a puddle of blood. For years, my great-grandmother insisted her husband was still alive out there. And then the camp was liberated, and he went home. A Purple Heart Award, Award E had a big family, had a long life, and was all around a great dude. Ten years after he passed, my brother is in a boy sc- in in a boy scout in a boy scout that sounds horrible my brother is in boy scouts i'm going to assume that's what the writer was trying to get by with us and my dad is the troop leader 
they were working on a bandage that required them to, to uh, tour the a local. Badge. I know I can't talk today. Oh God! You know what? You know what <laughs> I hate about aging. You know what? Hold on. <laughs> a side note. I have <laughs> exit ramp. I have bifocals. Uh huh. I just got them not too long ago, and they are messing up my reading. Let me tell you. You know what? Don't age if you can avoid it. It really sucks. Okay, they were working on a badge that requires them to tour a local library. While on the tour, the librarian shows off the genealogy section of the library. It is massive, and it is composed of a row, rows and rows of files in multiple metal drawers. She explains that they contain things like newspaper articles, death records, etc. From our county, dating back to the 1800s. She then opens a random drawer and pulls out a file. That was my grandpa, my grandpa's name, with my grandpa's name on it, my brother says. On the file, it was labeled with my great-grandpa's name and date, shocked the librarian, and inside the newspaper article announcing the date of when he had died on D-Day and a bit about him and my grandma. We didn't even know the article existed before that day. Obviously, my brother and dad are thoroughly creeped out as there was literally no way the woman could have known to pick that file. Weird coincidence or something else. That is an odd coincidence. I mean, and maybe it could be something else. What do you think, Mike? Now that I got my bifocals correctly on my face. <laughs> well, you don't need your bifocals to talk. No. So, um, so. I think a lot of people in the paranormal hold the the opinion that there's no such thing as a coincidence. Um, I, I do think that there are some instances where it's like, yeah, that is completely uh, a coincidence. Uh, like the story, I believe, from last week with the guy that was uh, watching the UFO show and walked outside and saw a UFO. I mm -hmm. think that's completely a coincidence. This one, however, I think is a little too... Uh, it, it's a little the odds are not in the favor that this is going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I, I think if anything, she was probably, um, I don't want to say psychically motivated, mm. but um, like I think she was led to mm. it. Um, I, I think if anything, somebody whether it's the grand, great grandfather himself that's just kind of always around because it's his family and probably wanted them to see this article mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they probably just put the idea in the librarian's head or whatever and kind of guided her towards this particular file so they could see it gotcha gotcha now a lot all these stories because it just got text asking me asking us that's nuts how is you know too much like made for television moment we take all these stories at face value. I mean, they could be true. We we, we assume that the writers are genuine and, and they're not trying to put one over on us in any way. But I, I could see where you could feel that it's a little made for television -y there for a moment. But uh, assuming that it's true, it is an odd moment. And it would it would give me pause, more than a little pause, a lot of pause for that to happen. It, it could be meant to be that they're meant to find that article. Maybe their grandfather was also reaching out, intervening in some ways. The, th the, the thing about that though, is there are, are, you know, quote unquote coincidences like this that happen all the time, mm -hmm. you know, re regardless of whether they're on, they're on the, the TV recreations or not. I mean, it yeah. is, it happens a, a lot where, you will just suddenly come across something that you've never seen before that you would have no real uh, way of, of doing it uh, and naturally. But I've and had those moments. On. See, there you go. It, it, it happens I, to you. And I'm sure you've had those moments. I have. Where, where, where it's just what are the odds? You know, that thing would come up or this would happen or that would happen. Where you swear you're looking around, looking for the cameras that are filming your reaction like you're on one of those kind of camera shows. So it does happen. I think you're absolutely right. It does happen more of the times than we realize. That probably happens to us a lot without giving it a second thought. 
that if we just sat back and really thought about it, what's involved too? Because a lot of it will just shoo away as coincidence. We won't really think too deeply into it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, moving on. So uh, my name is Karen Lewis. It's not. It's hers. But uh, <laughs> here's my encounter with the strange. When I was around 11, which was nine years ago, I lived in this house that my grandma owned. The whole time I lived in the house, we would always hear footsteps in the attic. The attic is too small for a person to actually stand up, so we just figured it was animals. But these footsteps were very heavy. We set traps up there all the time, but we never caught anything. So one day I was playing with my brother, and I was standing in front of the stairs, and he was in the living room. Uh, the lights upstairs were off, but there was a little light beside, a little light up there because of the living room. So we are, we are playing, and for some reason I look up the stairs, and I saw these two legs moving. They were moving in the direction of my room, and then they disappeared. I think it walked into my room because the o- it was the only door that was open. All I saw was the legs. No torso or anything. Just legs. It couldn't have been a reflection of anything, and no one was upstairs. I went to my mom and told her, and she went into my room and looked all over. There was nothing there. It's not an interesting story, but it freaked me out nonetheless. I can still clearly see the dark, shadowy legs in my memory. I'm pretty sure I didn't sleep in my room for a few weeks. Wow. Damn. So you're Damn. what you're talking about is two legs walking without any attachment with a body to it. And you're saying, oh, no, it's not all that creepy. Are you kidding me? That's freaking creepy. Yeah. <laughs> you see a couple legs walking your way with nothing attached to it. That, that'd that be creep factor 10. Come on. You'd run. I would not run. Well, because the legs would chase you. And, and, if, and if you're running, Mike, I firmly believe something's chasing you. <laughs> if we see you running, we better assume is, is that, there's a bear coming. Is that a fat you. joke? No. No, not in the least. <laughs> if that guy is running, I assure you something is behind him that is you. making him do it. I assure you something horrible is coming our way. We might want to think about moving ourselves. Yeah, see, see, that's why I, I make such a good paranormal investigator. I don't like running, period. So even, even if there's a demon standing in front of me, I'm like, <sighs> I haven't even stretched yet. <laughs> you're like a are you kind of like a cheetah you have to stre- i mean you know you don't see a lion stretch first just go i i, I am a cheetah i can you, you are a <laughs> i cheetah. move i move that fast. you have the fastest t- 10 feet anyone's ever seen yeah I, I could beat anybody in the first 10 feet that, that that's right that's right but getting back I have to the stop. story care that that is a, oh right sorry that is a strange tale now it, I've heard similar tales, and it's it's it would be unnerving to see that. You're right, but also it, it would pique my interest. You know what's going on, why it's going on, stuff like that. And but at nine years old, yeah, that'd be a lot to absorb. I mean, we're looking at it yeah. from adult eyes, going and investigator eyes, going, hmm, that'd be interesting to see. But nine years old, that would be pretty freaky. No, actually, she was 11 years old. This happened nine years ago. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so she's still fairly young. Well, she's still young, yeah. Um, what, I, what I would like to know is what the mom's reaction was. So she just said, I went to my mom and told her, and she went into my room and looked like her mom wasn't. Be like, what? You saw legs? What, Excuse me? See, what? What what'd you see? What are you talking about? What? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, no, exactly. no, like, shocking moment for mom. Like, eh, that old legs? Don't play no mind. <laughs> Those things are always <laughs> running up and down these hallways. You know, the the thing is, though, I mean, and, and I say this to clients all all the time of when they're like, well, I hear footsteps. Uh-huh, and? And then that's it. <laughs> I, I mean, footsteps. I honestly think that, that this is probably more residual than than anything. Yeah. And you uh, just happen to look up and, so. at the proper time and, and saw this, this energy, you know, replay itself you know going into what maybe once was their room very well could be that does sound like a residual thing going on more than anything else i would have to mm-hmm. say you know didn't really seem to show you really according to the writer 
no real intelligence behind it other than legs walking around. Yeah, and footsteps so, in the attic, and that was yeah, it. That was it. That was it. Show me more. Come on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back right after this. Don't go anywhere. Hi, Tom Bodette. If you can hear me, then you have an internet connection, which means you can do cool things online, like listen to streaming radio, obviously, or watch a video of a monkey washing a cat. Let your freak flag fly. Or you can book a room at a great price at motel6.com. Isn't the internet wonderful? Everything you want right at your fingertips, and whoa, did not need to see that. <clears throat> I'm Tom Bodette from Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. My student loan is totally paid off. I can't believe it. I can't believe it either. I paid more than the minimum each month, and soon enough, it was gone. So you're just giving up? Giving up on what? The life of luxury. Egyptian cotton, caviar Thursdays, designer everything. What are you talking about? Our plan. What happened to winning the lottery and mastering the art of the perfect mimosa? Hosting galas, wearing enough jewelry to require a bodyguard, vacationing in the French Riviera, and then buying it. I just thought maybe it was time to prepare for my future. You know, set some financial goals, make some smart investments, open a 401k. Financial goals? Investments? A 401k? You are horrified right now. Listen, if winning the lottery were easy, everyone would do it. When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Northern Tool and Equipment. So me and the boys head out to tailgate today and find some other fans in our spot. Well, it happens. Uh, cheering for the wrong team. Oh, this is war. Even worse, they've got this couch set up and everything. A couch? Yeah, it's a uh, sectional. All right, first thing, don't ever use the word sectional again. Done. Second, I want you to grab a 4,700-pound tow chain with J-hook and grab hammer. Throw that on the back of your truck. Got it. Now you're going to hail Mary the J-hook over the end of that couch. Time to find a better spot for your new friends. That should do it. There's no problem. A little horsepower can't solve. Northern Tool and Equipment. Taking a family of five to the amusement park can cost a small fortune. Oh, yeah. So to save some money, we thought, hey, let's bring the amusement park to us. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, step right up. Step right up, young man. Are you ready to ride the wacky waterfall? That's just the bathtub with the shower head running. Nope, it's the Wacky Waterfall. It's the shower, Dad. Waterfall. Wacky. There's an easier way to save. To get a free rate quote, go to Geico.com. Then buy online, over the phone, or at your local Geico office. Green light. Hey, girl. School zone. I'm getting hungry. Car changing lanes. You want to meet me for pizza? Stop sign. Intersection clear. Yeah, street. Pizza sounds good. Ball in street? Girl in street! <gasps> It's hard to concentrate on two things at once, like texting and driving. Stop the text, stop the wrecks. How will you stop texting and driving? Tell us at stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome back to After Hours AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis. Right along with me is Mr. Michael O'Neill. And we're some Zoinks. Right, zoinks. Raggy. Ro- 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 we're, we're reading your stories. You just zoinked me out of nowhere. Like, not even a warning. Not even a... No, never going to warn you. Never going to warn you. Never going to warn you. Wow. You, really you don't warn, warn someone of their, their impending you, zoinks. You, you never warn them about getting zoinked? Impen- no. Impending no, you never, zoinked? No. <laughs> it's a, uh, um, it's a, what is it, a pre-assault or whatever they call it? Yeah, Pre- there you go. Like a sucker punch st- almost. Strike. Yeah, preemptive yeah. strike. Hi, Pre-emptive okay, stri- gain, gain, here, let's let's get back into the list of stories, <laughs> shall we? Hi, I'm Jim, and this is my tale. So late last night, I was watching a reality TV show shows till pretty late and went to sleep almost 4 a.m. 
I went to my bedroom and tried to sleep. When I, w when I was almost falling asleep, like at the point you're almost there, but still a little bit conscious. Yeah, I've been there. I heard my bedroom door open, and I thought it was my dad because of the noise. It was obvious that was someone had opened the door and not the wind or something like that and felt him moving through my room. I remained unbothered because I thought maybe he came here to grab something or and continued to try to fall asleep until I heard the thing crying. Not really crying, but do you guys know when after you cry and you try to breathe and you were sobbing? Yeah, I heard that thing, the thing doing that. At that moment, I obviously knew I wasn't it wasn't my father and recovered my total consciousness. But keep I kept my eyes closed. I don't I don't kind of don't blame you. I mean, that thing's crying. You know, no one likes a crying clown. And I kept telling myself it was just me having a dream until it did it again. Like it was trying to stop crying and I was completely petrified. I heard, heard it the one more time, but very far away and got the courage to open my eyes and turn the lights on. No one was there, but I heard it was, I heard it get me, oh, okay, I heard it and it gave me the chills because at the moment I could feel something staring and standing in my room. What do you guys think it was? Was it something bad? I really don't know what to think about it or what to do if it happens again. Wow, man. <laughs> okay, multiple things here. One, you should never stay up late or at at all watching reality TV. No, that's just no. No, rot your brain. That, that, yeah, yeah, just just don't do that. Um, and I, I think he means like the hyperventilating, like the yeah, you know that kind of yeah. thing. You know, where, yeah. where you're having a hard time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've had that happen to me. Um, the thing that gets <laughs> the other thing that gets me is why is your dad? Is it like normal for your dad <laughs> right? to just come was, into your room uh, and you're trying to sleep that, to grab something? When I was reading that, I thought to myself, that's a little strange. You know, no, normally people don't just saunter into your room middle of the night, especially, you know, you'd hope not a parent, you, you know, or anyone else just coming in while you're trying to fall asleep. I would have looked right away, dad or not. I, I would I in that moment, I just know myself. I would have looked. I don't care who's coming in. I want to know who it is, whether I know you or whether I don't know you. Well, yeah, and why? I mean, if, yeah. If what are you doing here? Or, what 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 do you want? You, you know, yeah, what, what, what are you, you looking need? for? Why am I <laughs> room rummaging through my property? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing is, what what on earth would make you think that this is bad? Like, it's it's it. Let, let's just say, for the sake of argument, that this is a random spirit that came to you or came into the house or whatever uh, under the. Uh, the assumption maybe that he could find some help, you know, he's, he's hurting or whatever, whatever happened to him. And he starts to cry and you think that it's, it's bad. Yeah. Or like, it, it's, I don't want to say evil, but like it's not negative. I mean, it obviously didn't hurt you in any way, shape or form. Um, the other thing that I really like is the fact that again, you put in there, like you did this last night, like you woke up in the morning. It was like, I got to write Mike. And, Mike right. And Joel. Hey, hey. What can I say? We have, we have a we have an audience that wants to get their stuff out right away, and I commend you guys for that, one hundred percent. But I don't know. Like you said, what makes you think it's evil? What what was what was the vibe? You don't mention what kind of vibe you're feeling. I mean, you were obviously freaked out because you're between that wake and sleep moment. Now, a lot of people, when they're in that twilight moment. They'll hallucinate things. I know I have. Uh, you know, you'll hear a noise or you think you heard a noise or, or whatever because your brain is kind of falling asleep, but it's not quite awake. And that is usually when you're going to hear what they hear, uh, the ear slamming phenomena. You ever heard of that where it's that, well, you swear to God you heard something really loud next to your ear when you're trying to fall asleep. Like, bam. Mm -hmm. It's a phenomenon no. out there. 
and I forget the exact name, and I'll come up with it later if you guys are interested. But it, a lot of people have that phenomena where they're falling asleep, they're in that twilight state, and they'll hear something crash or slam. Things, but nothing happened. Nothing, nothing fell. It's, it's your brain messing with you a little bit, and it's not real uncommon. But this guy now, this uh, Jim, heard something that sounds more than once, sounded like it was crying or, or trying to catch its breath after crying. Again, I don't see where that would end it at all to being evil. Uh, you could have had uh, a lot of different phenomena going on there. Or, like you said, it could be a spirit dropping in. Just things like that. I mean, uh, I mean, it's creepy nonetheless. Don't get me wrong, but I'm more creeped out about your dad coming to your room. <laughs> that, that, you know well, the, the thought of your the thought the thought of of his father coming in the yeah room. i yeah. would have been more freaked out about that like dad what do you want don't go in the third drawer <laughs> um so th- there's two things that i would like to, to say about this though I, in, in an all serious thing is i i have it's not necessarily that exact thing but when i try to go to sleep uh a lot of times I will think that I hear voices like my name or a hi or, or something like that. Yes. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll also mistake um, – like when you when you lay down, you know, maybe you have mucus or whatever in your nose and it'll squeal. And when since you're trying to – you're about to fall asleep, they're like echoes in your mind and in your ear. And it sounds way different. Uh, I know there's been a lot of times where I've suddenly been like, poof, you know, uh, yeah. wide awake because I heard something and I, I then try to recreate it by breathing in, in, a, in a certain way. And most mm-hmm. of the time I, I can actually re- I can do it. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I would like to point out is spirits, uh, for the most part, just wander. <laughs> They're just um, kind of round. They, they do. Um, I actually – I was having – I had two mediums on on my team at one point in time. This was before Odyssey even existed. And we were all having a meeting in my living room. And I kept noticing that one of them kept looking into my kitchen because you could see into my kitchen and my kitchen table from from the couch. And finally, I was just like, what? <laughs> what, 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 what are you looking at? She's like, oh, she's like, there's just this lady sitting at your kitchen table. And I'm like, oh, well, good. <laughs> Good yeah. for her. Yeah. And we went back to our meeting. And I think like maybe five minutes later or something, I was like, is she still there? She's like, no, she's gone. She just well, liked your kitchen. Well, <laughs> there you go. You know, somebody I mean, she had, she had no, Yeah, she had no connection to me or, or the home. Uh, she might have just been walking past. And I think I would probably do that, too. If I was a free-floating apparition or whatever that could actually go anywhere, I'd probably go... I think I'd probably do it in Beverly Hills, but that's just me. Aren't you worried, um, though, if that's the case? Let's just say you're just floating around doing your own thing. Aren't you worried about getting bored after a certain amount of time? I kind of am. Like, okay, I've floated everywhere in the <laughs> world. I mean, where else can I go? I'm now now I what do I do? You know, I've gone in the girls' locker room already. <sighs> many, gone to the, many, got to the Playboy Many mansion. girls' locker rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done everything I can do in this afterlife. Now what did I do? I mean, I got an eternity that's floating around crap. <laughs> Does you ever I, think I, about that? Like maybe you get bored? No. Uh-uh. I'd find something. See, I, See, maybe that's why the hauntings start. That's like the next step. This is where good ghosts so, go bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, ghosts go wild. That's what. Uh, because you get bored. <laughs> So then you start. I'm gonna mess with people now. You know what? Yeah. Now, now is the haunting. Is is yeah, the haunting yeah. stage? Yeah. I took my vacation. Now I'm gonna mess with people. It's gonna be a good time. <laughs> well, not for them, but for me. And and, yeah. and you know we're we're gonna do this. And, and you know it could be like a Beetlejuice situation. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna be like that. Not not at all. Oh uh, yeah yeah. All right. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, that 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 whole thing could have been. Um, a lot of different things. I would like to know if it happens again. Me too. I mean, if it, if it's a if it's a one time thing, I wouldn't worry about it any way, shape, or form. And I definitely don't think it had any ill intentions towards you no. whatsoever. No, maybe it's just having a bad moment, dropped a couple of tears. 
Maybe you had an asthmatic <laughs> ghost in your hands. He's... <laughs> I'm going to skip that one. (laughs) (laughs) All right. All right. Next one. So, hi, it's Paul, and I live in West Virginia. Hey, Paul, you've written before. How you been? There's only one person named Paul in West Virginia? No, but I know this Paul, kind of, sort of. Okay. Through social media. Kind of. Gotcha. So, uh, he says, I don't know what I saw. Shapeshifter or some weird animal. Me and two of my... Me and two friends uh, I was with were down uh, walking an old back road. It was around 2 or 3 a.m. when I saw the thing. At first, it looked like a huge black cat. Uh, Then, uh, when going behind a tree, it came out on two legs and ran off. I didn't see much detail point uh, with it being near pitch black. The only reason I saw it in the first place was due to my weak flashlight. Joel, is this something... (laughs) Or am I insane? You're insane. No, I'm kidding. You're, you're, you, you Don't worry, I'm, I'm out of this one. He only wants your opinion. Well, no, I'm, I'm sure he'd like your opinion as well, so we'll dive nope, into nope, this for nope. a minute. No, You didn't ask for it. <laughs> now, shapeshifters, there's, there's a lot of stories I've got over the years about shapeshifters, and, and yours is not wholeheartedly uncommon. A lot of them are seen, much like you're seeing them, um, you know, kind of odd times and seeing this happen. Uh, shapeshifters from understand a lot of when we've done shows about it he it may have not known that you were there because shapeshifters tend not to want to shape shift ship shift whatever you want to say when there's an audience so it may not even known you were there where it did this shape shifting thing now what do I think bottom line is boy I just it, it that is creepy it looked like a huge black cat. We all know Mike's love for cats. Then when oh, going yeah, behind I'm... a tree, it came out on two legs and ran off. Did it remain in the... Sh- I guess I've got a couple questions for you. And if you could email back. A, did it remain? I'm assuming it remained in the shape of the cat when it was on the two legs. It would be interesting to see whether or not you can make out that it had actually changed its form completely. Or if it was just a cat walking on two legs and then ran off. Either way, it's kind of different. I've never seen a cat walk on two legs. I'm Werewolf. Not, y- y- well, a were cat at this point, maybe. You know, you know. But there are people. Now, I saw a dog man years ago. For my very I, own eyes. I don't have anything to say to that. Oh, you, you don't know a dog man? You don't know who dog man I know man dog man, is? but I, 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 I haven't seen dog man. You haven't seen so him. I, you, you are familiar, though, with Dogman. Uh, vaguely. Okay. Anyhow, and I will tell the tale later on when we have a little more time because it's quite involved. But what you saw would be, I don't know if it's so much as a shapeshifter or it could have been something altogether different that was walking on his hind legs. I guess I need more information to really give a, a really good opinion on it. How about you, Mike? No, I'm I'm not giving an opinion. See, now you heard his feelings, folks. <laughs> now, Mike has a fragile ego. And, and, I do. And, I'm and, just kidding. And, 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 you know, we, we, we care for him. I need a constant, I, constant I, I source of positive I t- reinforcement. I, I took him in. You remember, you, remember, <laughs> you remember, guys, I took him in. Remember, we all decided yeah. to take him in. Your lives Pull all him got to so the much bosom better. of After Hours A.M., the nation that is after hours a.m. We brought him in. So, Paul, as much as I respect you, make sure to put two names in to avoid the crying that may be associated with such an Yeah, maybe, may, maybe Jim heard me from, from the future. He, he might have heard you. He might have. He might have heard you. Who knows? Um, Who knows? But we do. You know, the... Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I was actually going to throw in that, I mean, there, there's just not enough stuff here to, to I mean, because it's nearly pitch black, and um, it was a black cat, and you have a weak flashlight, and it's two or three in the morning. I mean, it's, it's uh, I, I guess for me, 
there's just not enough thing here to say that you saw you saw it as well as you yeah. need you would need to in order to classify that you saw a big black cat switch into a person yeah well uh, on legs uh, uh yeah tim says he just texted us thank you again the text in line is 612-326-6874 612-326-6874 should you feel the need to chime in we're here for you we love to have the interaction tim says is it possible that you might have been watching the cat climb a tree being it was so black that as it's climbing that tree, it looks like it's on its hind legs. It's actually a very, very good thing. Yeah, uh, again, it, this is one of those things on where black we, with we, a bad we, flashlight. So who knows? Yeah, we we would we would have to be there in order to 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 see it. What you were seeing at that time? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Now we got our. We only got ten minutes left. We got to get to this. We got our ask mics here. That are, that are going on. <laughs> we're we're going to call them that, even though they don't specifically say Ask Mike. But yeah, you I'm are kidding. included. So we are going to do barely this one. Hey, Joel, Mike. If he wants to chime in. <laughs> okay. I almost didn't read yeah. that part, but I had to. Do you believe <laughs> in the Mothman? And do you think he was the winged creature recently sighted in Chicago? You know, I have been to the TNT area. I have been to West Virginia. I've been to that area, Moundsview, all those places. And they bo- firmly believe in the Mothman. I believe they believe they saw something. But for me, personally, and this is just me personally, there isn't really enough hard evidence for me to say, yes, there was a Mothman. And there's not enough evidence for me to say, no, there was not a Mothman. So I'm kind of on that fence, and do I think it was recently cited over Chicago? You know, from what I understand, we were on the air. We had some eyewitnesses come on the show while it was happening in Chicago, and it looked more like a bat creature than it did the Mothman when, when people were describing it, and a few people did have some pictures, things like that. I'm not sure what that was over Chicago. I know it, it, it started quickly, and then it ended just as quickly. It, no one has really any explanation for what it was. Mike, you're familiar with it, am I correct? The Chicago, um, yeah, yeah, the Chicago Mothman sightings, yeah. Um, in fact, uh, what show was it? What? Oh, it was um, Expedition X. Their their very first yeah episode uh, was about the Mothman, and they actually went to Chicago. And there's another uh, documentary. I think it's called Birds of Prey. Um, that's on Amazon Prime. Sure. And it has like it has like Lauren Coleman and yeah. somebody from Illinois. It's all about these huge bird like creatures that have been seen all over Illinois. Um, and that talks about it as well. Mm-hmm. So I mean I don't think it's Mothman. Uh, I think Mothman e- existed. What what he what he is, I have no idea. No. Um w- I, obviously, it's not a, a ghost, but I mean, is it like a cryptid? Is it a government science experiment that got loose? Is the harbinger um, of things to go wrong? Because they've said I, that as yeah, well. I, I don't. It's, it's 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 hard to know. One I want to touch on really quickly because I refuse to answer, and I, it's not because I didn't like the question, but I think we're too close to the situation to give. Maybe in fifteen years we can look back on this situation. Do you guys think our government is covering something and using COVID-19 as a cover? I don't want to really weigh in on that. Um, okay. I, I, and I'm only going to say that because we're in the middle of it. And it's a kind of, to me, and again, no disrespect to anyone that might be thinking this or anything like that, but it's a bit like the 9-11 conspiracies. I, I, I just don't like to speculate on something like this at all. I don't believe it's my place. I'm not learning enough in the science. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, we know what we know through mainly news organizations, but I don't believe our government is covering anything up with this. I believe it's a genuine illness attacking good people. Uh, I, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. What do you think? 
you, well, you for know. somebody that doesn't want to chime in. I know, I know, but I, I certainly just, just chimed in. I know, I had to. <laughs> I couldn't help myself, but I, I just, I don't want to say it's a conspiracy. Uh, I don't think it's a, cons- a cover up of any kind, is what I'm saying. But I don't want no, to go any further than that either. to speculate on anything because I don't have enough information. Neither one of us do, and no, nor does anybody have enough information to give a, a qualified response. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's way too early to, to make that call, but based on what I've seen so far, um, my answer is no. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. I mean, it, will that change? I have no idea, but we'll see. But right now, it's no. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. Okay, have an, another odd Have an odd question. How would you survive the zombie apocalypse, Mike? I would kill everybody. No, just kidding. <laughs> Actually, I don't think I would. Um, I don't think I'd be taken out by zombies. I think I'd be too smart for that, if I may be arrogant for a minute. Um, I actually think I'd probably be more taken out by the other survivors. <laughs> like, I would probably just be like, yeah, you're on my crew. And then my crew would just hack me to pieces because <laughs> I'm delicious. Because so, you're I mean, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> well... You know, I don't think it would necessarily be uh, uh, the zombies that will get you. I think it would be other people because, again, you know, like you said, uh, the zombies are would be fairly easy to to dodge, you know, I would think, after a while. Especially anyone with a twenty two pistol or rifle could take out a whole bunch of them at one time. I think it's the people. Again, I'm in the same camp you are. I think it would be the people that would get me before the zombies. Right, but I would have a lot of fun killing zombies in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I would too. But I guess it would depend on what kind of zombies we're talking about. I mean, we're we talking about the slow moving ones. They're like, eh, are we talking about the like? Well, one, let's stay you know, with thirty miles an hour. Well, let's and, let's be a purist here and let's do the George Romero type, the creeping death. Zombie. Okay. Then yeah. yeah then know. yeah. I, I, I e, e, even even as a fat tub, I would still I'd be able to outrun zombies. Yeah, because the fast ones were all kind of screwed there, like twenty eight days later kind of fast ones. Yeah, I'm not quite so sure I'd fare very well in a foot race with them. But you know, yeah. you know. But anyhow, oh, that's a, such an odd question. I love it. I love it. I never really gave it a lot of thought. How would I survive the zombie apocalypse? Would you die right away? I, I probably would. I probably. I'm too nice. <laughs> I'd be like, "Oh, hey, can I help you?" And it'd, it'd be a zombie and eat my brains. Real? No, 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 no. You're not going to try to be nice to a zombie. No. Well, you don't know it's a zombie yet. Well, if it's your neighbor, right? You don't even know the outbreak has happened yet. And if yet, my neighbor came over and was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, I would probably know he's not right in the head. most of my neighbors already look that way. So Listen I went, the show. You, you know, <laughs> you know, especially on Sunday mornings where they're shuffling around after the night at the bar when they used to be open. So, wow, I, I don't know. <laughs> just, I, wow. I, I don't know. You're just wow. Whatever. Wow. <laughs> Wow, man. No, in all honesty, I would rock that crap. I would rock the zombie apocalypse. I'd become a cult leader so fast. I'd have my own minions and everything. I'd have a bat wrapped in barbed wire called Lucille. Yeah. That's what I'd be doing. Wow. See, (laughs) See, it's my fantasy now. Let me live it. (laughs) Okay. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm wowing it. That's all I'm, that's there all I'm you saying. Go. We got to go to break. We'll be right back with Michelle Bellinger. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back right after this. Hi, Tom Bodette. If you can hear me, then you have an internet connection, which means you can do cool things online, like listen to streaming radio, obviously, or watch a video of a monkey washing a cat. Let your freak flag fly. 
Or you can book a room at a great price at motel6.com. Isn't the internet wonderful? Everything you want right at your fingertips and, whoa, did not need to see that. I'm Tom Bodette for Motel 6, and we'll leave the light on for you. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. My student loan is totally paid off. I can't believe it. I can't believe it either. I paid more than the minimum each month, and soon enough, it was gone. So you're just giving up? Giving up on what? The life of luxury. Egyptian cotton, caviar Thursdays, designer everything. What are you talking about? Our plan. What happened to winning the lottery and mastering the art of the perfect mimosa? Hosting galas, wearing enough jewelry to require a bodyguard, vacationing in the French Riviera, and then buying it. I just thought maybe it was time to prepare for my future. You know, set some financial goals. Make some smart investments. Open a 401k. Financial goals? Investments? A 401k? You are horrifying right now. Listen, if winning the lottery were easy, everyone would do it. When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Northern Tool and Equipment. So me and the boys head out to tailgate today and find some other fans in our spot. Well, it happens. Yeah, cheering for the wrong team. Oh, this is war. Even worse, they've got this couch set up and everything. A couch? Yeah, it's a uh, sectional. All right, first thing, don't ever use the word sectional again. Done. Second, I want you to grab a 4,700-pound tow chain with J-hook and grab hammer. Throw that on the back of your truck. Got it. Now you're going to hail Mary the J-hook over the end of that couch. Time to find a better spot for your new friends. That should do it. There's no problem. A little horsepower can't solve. Northern Tool and Equipment. Taking a family of five to the amusement park can cost a small fortune. Oh, yeah. So to save some money, we thought, hey, let's bring the amusement park to us. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, step right up. Step right up, young man. Are you ready to ride the wacky waterfall? That's just the bathtub with the shower head running. Nope, it's the Wacky Waterfall. It's the shower, Dad. Waterfall. Wacky. There's an easier way to save. To get a free rate quote, go to Geico.com. Then buy online, over the phone, or at your local Geico office. Green light. Hey, girl. School zone. I'm getting hungry. Car changing lanes. You want to meet me for pizza? Stop sign. Intersection clear. Yeah, street. Pizza sounds good. Ball in street? Girl in street! <gasps> It's hard to concentrate on two things at once, like texting and driving. Stop the text, stop the wrecks. How will you stop texting and driving? Tell us at stoptextstoprex.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome back to After Hours AM. I'm your host, Joel Sturgis. Right along with me is Mr. Michael O'Neill. Michael, who are we talking to tonight? Oh, we have a very special guest. Um, I, I, I had the pleasure of talking with her about a month or so ago and really looking forward to to tonight to continue that. So she is an author, a lecturer. Um, you've seen her on shows like Paranormal State and now Portals to Hell. Um, psychic medium extraordinaire um, and just all around a good person <laughs> please welcome uh, to the show for the first time Michelle Belager good evening Michelle hello how you guys holding up good good we're like you we're uh, in a shelter in place order in our state as well so we're making the best of the time that we have doing a lot of radio stuff so that's been a good thing and then, uh, of course, I know that you've been really busy as well. We we're talking off air, and and I did not know Ohio now. We have, I have a good friend in Ohio, Eric Olson, and and yeah. you, you guys have been locked down two weeks longer than about everybody else. What's it like? I hate to bring up the subject matter of the virus, but it's hard not to these days. What's it like over there? Are, are things getting better over on that side of the country, or is it kind of like here where it's still peaking? I mean, it's sort of in a holding pattern. I think because they locked us down a little sooner than everybody else, our, they, they did that, like, flatten the curve, so our numbers aren't spiking quite the same as everybody else's. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it, 
It feels surreal. I live at the end of a cul-de-sac, so, you know, suburbia. There's a whole bunch of families with kids, and it just sort of feels like the 80s all over again because nobody in our neighborhood is sick, and it's just, you know, the kids are out in their yards, on their bikes, just hanging around, chalking the walk. Like, it, it just, I don't know. I mean, there's, of course, the pressure. I know everybody is out of work. I only know a few people who are in... Uh, jobs that are considered essential mm -hmm. uh, and every store for miles is out of toilet paper because <laughs> apparently that's what you buy it <laughs> i guess i was shocked when that yeah. happened to be honest i i was thinking well i prepared for everything else but i didn't see the toilet paper thing coming i yeah, really did the tp caper of 2020 reese's ugly <laughs> head again right there it is it's gone <laughs> but uh yeah much the same thing over here we're we're in Minnesota, both me and Mike, and, and we're still very much peaking. We have not seen the extent of this, unfortunately. And gosh, I hope we get through it all. We, I, I just pray we all get through it as good as we can. And maybe we learn something along the way, too, about ourselves and, and stuff like that. Because I don't think we're ever going to truly go back to normal. But I, I think we will one day get some semblance back. I mean, the world didn't end with Spanish flu, so it's not going to end with this. It just it changes a lot of stuff. Yep, yep, exactly. But Michelle, what what's a nice girl like you in the paranormal? I mean, what got you going? What was your early days oh, like? I mean, I grew up I grew up out here in Ohio, which I suspect for most people doesn't seem like a particularly paranormal place. Except for when you step back and you realize how many paranormal celebrities and radio show hosts and podcast hosts are all from this state. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, Olsen and I'm blanking on everybody. There's so many. Um, Raymond Buckland, the witch. Uh, yep. Jim of the Paranormal Podcast. Uh, anyway, it's a weird state. I grew up in a family where psychic abilities were actually fairly normal. Um, and I was encouraged to to study more about them, to be open about the experiences. Uh, I wasn't um, I wasn't encouraged to take them just at face value without analyzing them, which mm -hmm. I think is one of really bears with how I work with it now. Um, I, I think of myself as an experiencer who is also uh, objective, if not skeptical. Uh, every time I'm in the field, it's it's an experiment. I don't assume that it's going to be right. Uh, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I Every experience is a way of, of enriching my understanding of these abilities. Well, my, my first experience was... Uh, it, there were too many early things to, to state, but the easiest one to point to was... Uh, I grew up in a little town called Hinkley. Hinkley is a small enough Ohio town that it celebrates the return of turkey vultures every year on the Ides of March. With Anything to sausage. drink. Yeah, <laughs> with, with pancakes and sausage. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a funny little town. But it had a library. It was a refurbished home, uh, and it was known for its ghost, the Blue Lady, or the Lady in Blue. Uh, and people started seeing her in the early 70s when they had bought the house and started to uh, redesign it to turn it into a library. And she is probably one of the first, if not the first, ghosts that I saw. Uh, I was four. I had no idea she was a ghost at the time. Mm -hmm. um, at, at that age, I didn't, I didn't really differentiate between spirits and people. Like She looked like a person and I didn't really know any better. Uh, there were a couple of things that she did that maybe didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, she didn't talk, and you know, if I think back to it, I like the sunlight. She didn't really cast a shadow, but I'm four, so I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. And it was years later doing research on the library, and it's it's haunted history because you know, as a teen, of course, everybody heard about the library being haunted. That in, in finding out that her name was Rebecca, um, what she looked like. I realized that I'd seen her when I was uh, at the library with my mom. Shortly before my first or my, my final open heart surgery, so I know I was between the ages of like uh, four and five. Hmm. Wow! And then, then oh, go ahead, Mike. I was gonna say, and then seeing well, that I was being say, four, 
and then obviously you didn't you know didn't register like you'd said that it was a ghost when you just dis- did you describe it to your mom what you'd seen and did she kind of did she talk to you about it or did she say that was a ghost how did you formulate it was a ghost well i i the memory really imprinted itself on me and so my, my mom and i talked about a lot of different experiences and i don't know that we actually talked about that one and the reason was is i uh I kind of felt guilty. I was in a part of the library I wasn't supposed to be in. Uh, so they were still doing construction on it. And my mom knew the librarian. They'd gone to college together, I think. And so she's downstairs talking. And, of course, I'm four, and I'm that four-year-old that has to explore everything. And the the stairs going up had, like, caution tape because they still had construction. And, of course, I had been told, absolutely, I was not supposed to go up there. So the men at mom's back turned. That's where I went. <laughs> I ducked under the tape. You know, made it up the stairs, uh, went to the top of the stairs and was just really disappointed because it didn't seem very scary or interesting or anything. Um, you know, poked my head into a door that was open and that room was mostly empty except for like some construction stuff like, you know, paint, uh, either a ladder or a sawhorse, like a, a drop cloth over one corner. And there was this woman standing at the windows and she was looking out. And what caught my attention and just held me enthralled at that age was she had this dress with all these tiny little buttons and a high collar. So the buttons went all the way up the back and up the, co- the collar uh, that was tight on her neck. And she had like these big poofy sleeves, but then they got tight on her forearms and there were all these little buttons on that too. And, you know, I'm four, so I'm still working on how to tie my shoes. Mm-hmm. And I am impressed <laughs> by how she possibly buttons all the buttons. Like that's, that's what I'm stuck on. Uh, she kind of like looks over her shoulder at me uh, this is how, in retrospect, I think it must have been an intelligent haunting, because she acknowledged that I was there. She didn't say anything to me, and if I'd had the word, I would have said that she looked melancholy. And she just went back to looking out the window. And then my mom called for me. And, you know, I got that, like, little guilty flush of, of shame, like I'm supposed to not be up here. So, you know, she's like, you know, Mickey, because that was my nickname back then, after the mouse. Um... <laughs> And I, I, I poke my head out the door, and I'm like, come on, Mom! And I don't want to admit where I'm at. Well, I poke <laughs> my head back in the door, and this door is the only way in and out of this room, and the woman's not there anymore. Mm-hmm. And with old logic, I just assume that she's not supposed to be in the room either, and see so if she's found a hiding place, I kind of like look around to see if there's a good place to hide. There isn't. So I go and face the music, since you know at this point it's going to be really obvious that I was exactly where I wasn't supposed to be. Um, and, and again, like if I hadn't done research much later in life, I wouldn't have known for sure that this was not just a random encounter. I mean, the dress was unusual. And so the whole thing stuck in my head. Um, trying to think of like the first, I don't know that I experienced my first ghost as a child that I spoke about with anybody until I was closer to my, like, you know, tween years. Okay. Um, yeah. I think largely because I just didn't, didn't think to, to converse about it. I mean, my, my aunts, my mom and my aunts said that they grew up in a haunted house. So they talked to me about their own experiences growing up. It was a house in um, a suburb of Cleveland called Lakewood, and they lived on Cohasset Avenue. And they would talk about, um, like, I guess a bunch of them shared an attic bedroom. Uh, there were there were five of them, four girls and one boy. Uh, and my grandmother was a single mother at the time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, like way back. Uh, and I remember Aunt Denise talking about like playing patty cake with a ghost. Like like they were playful. They weren't things that they were scared of. And that, that helped. You know, that these were things that you could talk about. These were things that weren't necessarily threatening. Um, they could be friendly. And... What that led me to do as I got older was read. Uh, I mean, I was an early reader to begin with, um, but I wanted to understand about this stuff. And the 70s were the perfect time for me to grow up because there was that, uh, there was kind of a craze for ESP and alien abductions and UFOs and, uh, you know, psychic experiences, ghosts, hauntings, like all of it. And... You know, there were TV shows for it from In Search Of to That's sure. Incredible. Uh, and again, it was just, 
it was this time where it was okay to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it did become okay to talk about. I mean, things opened up even more so to talk about it in the early two thousands, and so since yeah, then, it got- it's really been accepted more and more. Those early days was it hard to find acceptance, or was was it easy for you, or, or because of the family you came from? Um. It was easy for me, uh, partly the family, but also like where I grew up, the the town with a haunted library, everybody talking about experiences, hauntings were not unusual, psychic experiences were not that unusual. Um, So like by high school, I was the the weird kid that everybody accepted, like if they wanted their aura read or their energy, you know, read or whatever, like that was a regular thing. I would, everybody else would come into school and uh you know be at their lockers and i'd go down the hallway to my locker and there'd be two or three people who first thing in the morning would ask me like to read their energy like that's that was what i grew up with. <laughs> that, that is too cool that, that really is i don't know if i would want that or not i would i mean like i'm not i would be like i'm not a walking party favor guys well, well no i mean you know go live you your got, lives there, there was there was one <laughs> Gretchen, who like it was like every single day, and I'm like Gretchen, seriously. I'm building I, the image everyone... of you in my mind as you're talking, like Tuesday Adams, when you're young, <laughs> like you know, come get your aura read. But I'm sure that's not how it was. But you know, you've been into this a long time. You have a God-given gift or, or a given gift that that you've been using your whole life, and it seems like you not only used it, of course you've helped others too. I mean, you've written a lot of books. I mean, we got to get into some of this stuff and we will, but man, I mean, I'm going to step aside though here in a minute and give Mike a chance to talk because I'm hogging you. But all this form, all those formative years, it had to have helped. Like when you went into writing books, right? Are you able to, as you're drawing, because a lot of them will do research on the internet and do that kind of thing and write their book. It sounds like when you write though, it's coming from a deeper place, more personal experiences than just research. I mean, research definitely plays a part of it, but I started writing especially because you know, there was there was a process that I went through to understand how any of this worked. And as much as my family accepted things and like I had the perfect situation for becoming accepting of it myself, because I'm also an intellectual um, and naturally sort of skeptical, there was an internal struggle as I grew up to to really fully embrace this, to understand it, to like figure out like where it was coming from and to to accept that it was really real. You know, belief is one thing, but then there's there, there are aspects to this that are that we don't understand, like the science behind it and trying to apply science sometimes gets very slippery with these abilities. And part of my brain wasn't okay with that. Like, I wanted it all to make sense. And the process of coming to understand how my abilities worked, as well as learning how to accept when they were right, and to be objective about, like, my expectations and my experiences, that goes into the writing. Like, the first several books that I wrote were all about and all inspired by that process. Basically, (laughs) I wanted to share... How, how I got there, how I got to the point where I'm at, uh, so that other people could get there too. So one of the books um, that, he, that you wrote, and it's actually the 10th anniversary edition, it, is the uh, Dictionary of Demons. And is, is that out yet, or was that delayed so the, because of... Uh, well, I mean, the, the first one's out, the, the original is out and still for sale. The 10th anniversary does not launch until September. To oh, my knowledge, okay. yeah, to my knowledge, it's not delayed. Like, as far as I know, it's all still slated for, I think, September 8th. Uh, and that one is all research. Like, that one is where I get to, like, really stretch my wings. Um, I've got a degree in comparative religious studies uh, and, you know, went to a Jesuit college, so I learned demonology from the Catholics, uh, and was also very encouraged by uh, the the head of the religious studies department there, Dr. Joseph Kelly, to like really delve into um, theodicy, which is the academic study of the idea of the personification of evil. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, the, the Dictionary of Demons was my really kind of like my master my master's thesis, my PhD thesis, kind of all all put together. It's it's a fun romp if you're not intimidated by the names of demons. Mm-hmm. And I encourage people not to be, because if you go back to like the very earliest roots of demonology, while the name of an entity may call it up, that name has power over it. So you have more power knowing the name uh, to bind and to compel and to drive off these entities if you're going by all of the strict folklore and mythology around them. Mm-hmm. Why does knowing the name give you that kind of power, though, of the demon? I have always was curious, you know, just knowing its name gives you the power. But why is that? It's a really good question. Um, we know, so in the Christian tradition, uh, I believe it's in Mark and in Luke, it's the story of the Gerasene demoniac where uh, the uh, our name is Legion for We Are Many. It's the quote that gets kind of tossed around in like the exorcist and whatnot. Um, Jesus, when he drives these demons out, demands their name. Um, and that's why they, they say that we're Legion. We've got too many, or there's too many of us to give you one name. And then he drives them out into a herd of swine, and the herd of swine go over the cliff and kill themselves and basically kill the demons by proxy. Now, the folks who would have been contemporary to the writing of this gospel, who would hear this story of Jesus' act of exorcism, would be very familiar, would immediately recognize that as a type of exorcism because it was the most common type of exorcism in the ancient world. It went back to the cradle of civilization, Western civilization, Sumer and Babylon. Mm -hmm. And in um, ancient Sumeria, they had specific classes of priests whose job was to know the names of the demons, know the names of the powers, the gods and goddesses that controlled and could dispel them, and would handle exorcisms. Uh, In that culture, everything bad that happened to people came down to demons. Demons were these beings of disaster and disease and chaos. Um, Many of the demons, their name was synonymous with the evil that they did. So you had a demon whose name was basically migraine, and you had a demon whose name was basically stroke. Uh, Mm -hmm. You'd have demons, there would be COVID-19, quite honestly, at this point, Uh, and you would know their name, and that name gave you knowledge of what they were and what they did, and in the process of the ritual to bind, dispel, and destroy it, you used that name to get power over it, uh, and usually um, to put it into a proxy, sometimes a waxen image, sometimes a goat or uh, a pig. Um, and in those cases, it was a sacrificial animal, so you would basically kill the demon by proxy. You would remove it from the person, put it in this item or animal, and then destroy it. Wow, so they were looking wow. for power over disease. I mean, just a name, something to give it. Yeah, and so they had a face to it because we need a face to evil. Some some way they could make it better. That makes yeah, a lot of sense right. because they didn't understand yes. germs back then. They understand viruses. They understood what they knew from the church. Hmm. Yeah, it gave them that, something that they could do. Yeah, uh, so that they were sitting by feeling completely powerless because there's nothing worse than, than watching someone suffer and not being able to do anything at all about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was going to say that actually um, sounds like something big time. That's actually very relatable to me is I was told in one of my past lives that uh, I was a, a demon hunter and the reason for that was because my wife and child were killed by the black plague but i blamed it on demons and so i went on like this huge uh vengeance tour i i I guess you could say and so hearing you say that we would put demonic names towards these these things actually makes a lot of sense to me then the sixty four thousand dollar question is do demons exist then or are they just disease? Are they just mishap? Are there real demons? 
In my opinion, it depends on what you mean by demon. I end up, in having studied this from both a theological perspective, a mythological perspective, a literary perspective, like going through all of the written stuff um, that, that makes up the source material for the Dictionary of Demons, uh, there's... I'll go with my own belief, like based on my mm-hmm. own experiences. Um, I do think that people toss people in the paranormal toss the word demon around a little bit too freely. Uh, I think that oh, there's yes, they do. not nearly as many demons out there as people are sure there are. Like, like they don't know what else to call it. It's scary. Actually, they're they're in the same boat that the Sumerians were. Here's something that's big, bad, and scary, and I don't understand what it is. It must be a demon. Mm-hmm. And that said. I have, on a few rare occasions, encountered something that um, does not appear to have ever been human, is very intelligent, uh, and is malevolent in a way where it seems motivated to really harm people. Like, people catch its attention, and it is focused on, if not actively hurting them, then just making their lives miserable to do to do things like uh it, it varies but they do seem to i guess short version is i mean, i have encountered some things that i would give that label to very cautiously now does that mean that i think that these things uh automatically prove that there's a heaven or a hell or a, a god or a mm-hmm. satan uh, no I, I i don't think that that's that's not within my wheelhouse to judge one way or the other. W- what I will say is I have encountered a few spirits that seem to fit the bill. Like, they make me understand why people would create this class of beings. Yeah. Like, make the, there are some things that, like, this isn't human, it's big, it's bad, it's very smart, and it is out to f- screw people up. Hmm. I I, uh, so, I believe that. I know, Mike, I'm sure you do, too. I mean, there's just, that is out there, but it's got to be the minority, not the majority. Not like popular media, some popular media would have us believe. I, I can count, like, on one hand, really, the instances that I was, like, willing to say, yes, this is a demon. And I've been doing investigations for, what, 30 years now? <laughs> yeah, I um back back on uh, on the Odyssey Files. We had um, a game show that we did where we polled everyone like Family Feud, and one of our questions was, "What is the most uh, common type of haunt?" Thinking that we would get you know a lot of uh, intelligent, a lot of residual, and I polled everyone that I knew that was in the paranormal field and got that. And uh, Dave, my co-host went to his work who just people, people (laughs) that were normal civilians just posted the, the, the the questions up there with a bunch of lines underneath it. And we each got around 36 to 38 people uh, polled. Mm -hmm. I had zero De- demonic thing. He had 18 <laughs> people say that demonic was the most common type of haunt out there. And I can't tell you how many times um, people think that if anything is going on in their home, that it's automatically evil and bad and is out to hurt them and is demonic. And I, I, I practically scream now, it's not demonic. Like, I don't even care what the claims are. It's not demonic. <laughs> and I mean, have you noticed that, that people are just, they're so inclined that anything that happens, whether there's heavy footsteps walking to the, the their door in the middle of the night, that they are automatically assuming that it is evil and it is a demon? Oh, yeah. I mean, some of it's cultural and some of it is pop cultural. Like, mm-hmm. the media has absolutely primed people to assume that everything that goes bump in the night must be a demon. Uh, and, and not just, you know, paranormal reality shows, but also movies, books, mm-hmm. yep. uh, fiction that we are exposed to. Like, from from The Exorcist on down, I mean, for as long as I have been alive, because <laughs> The Exorcist came out in 73, uh, demons have been on the big screen as the big bad. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and they're a really easy big bag. Uh, they're, they're not going to have a... Um, it, it's... Pardon me, there was some very weird pounding. <laughs> we have that effect on people. Yeah. No, no, seriously, like, there there was... There were three loud raps. Could you go just check to make sure it was anything? <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! Oh, good. Oh, no. That, actually, don't, that actually leads me into my next question. But, fin, f- but finish your answer. I was to the say, don't one. crash my studio. No, no, not like other people have. No. <laughs> Unusual. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so something an opinion about that. Uh, anyway, mm-hmm. I will say that as someone who's had boots on the ground in investigations. Most people assume demon because that's the easiest word that they've got for something that scared them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of hauntings aren't actually evil or even dangerous. They're just scary because you don't have an answer of what is it. Yeah. And mm-hmm. threat assessment is a part of it, too. Will this hurt me? Can this hurt my family? Can this hurt my pets? Like, what do I do to stop it? Um, all of that is very intimidating, and so it's easy to assume that it's evil just because you don't know that it's not, But if that makes any sense. Yeah, Michelle, do you remember the 1980s demonic hysteria back in the day? Oh, remember that? Yes. I mean, yes, the satanic panic? Yes, yeah. this is nothing yeah. compared to back then. <laughs> oh, my God. Satan, there were, like, Satanists meeting in the woods, yes. sacrificing babies. The whole like ritual abuse, like all of it, it was it was a craze, um, stoked by a lot of people who, you know, honestly were were writing stuff that was spurious, that was absolutely aimed at stoking this this hysteria. Um, you know, it was it was the original. Well, I won't say it was the original fake news, but it really was fake news. Oh yeah, um, remember twenty twenty even had a big thing of John Stossel as your neighbor, a demon worshiper. Find out now. <laughs> No, it was, seriously, it was it was that <laughs> it was that bad. It really was, and I would say it's almost calmed down from the eighties, you know, because really everybody thought Ooh. their neighbor was a demon, a lover, or whatever. Thank was God, going I was on. a child. Yeah, and, and so today's world, because of like you'd said, the influences by and large of the movies and the TV and the books and stuff like that. Yeah, it's it's out there and it's it's on a lot of people's minds and lips only because that's what they can relate to. But back then, it was a whole nother level. It was nuts. Thank God so we don't go do back anymore. To three knocks. We're not actually sure what they were. <laughs> what, the three knocks you heard previously? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that actually leads me to my next question because I have been, I've been trying to find somebody uh, that I, I believe would, would would be able to answer this for me in an intelligent fashion, and I definitely believe that you are one of these people. Where did the thought, because nobody's been able to answer this if I've ever put it out, where did the thought or the theory that anything that comes in threes is some sort of demonic mockery of the trinity because I, I can't understand how people are like, I heard three knocks on my wall. Just it's got to be demonic. Well, exactly. But, I mean, it, it happens in cases all over the place. If I even yeah. mention, like, three, if there's any any claim that involves the number three, I all, all automatically see my investigator's eyes go wide, and they're suddenly thinking that this possibly could be demonic. But I, I, I just find it hard to believe that one knock is human, two knock is human, three knock is demonic, Four Knox is human. Uh, so, what brought that on? That that it, a lot of investigators think that anything that has to do with three is some sort of mockery, demonic mockery of the Trinity. I'm pretty sure it goes back to Ed and Lorraine Warren. Um, Lorraine was the first place I heard that from. Um, she firmly believed it. Uh, it's clearly from her Catholic background. I'm not sure where she would have gotten the idea um, or if they developed it themselves. But I, the Warrens were where I first heard it. And because of their popularity, because of the number of books that they have out or have out about them, and especially recently because of like The Conjuring and all of the movies that have been based off of their work, their theory, um, their fervent belief, I'm going to say it's definitely a belief, 
that three things that come in threes, knocks, scratches, whatever, are intentional mockeries of the Trinity. I, I lay it firmly on Ed and Lorraine's doorstep. I would agree with you. That's you the first you do not believe. you do not believe that. No, I don't believe it. Um, I I can see why they would believe it based on. Um, I mean, Lorraine was probably the most Catholic person I've ever met. Um, like incredibly <laughs> devout, and in that way of Catholicism lends itself to mysticism and magic very easily. I mean, it's one reason why. You know, Mexican Catholic and Italian Catholic and Irish Catholic are all very unique things because Catholicism melded with the original religious practices, the magical practices of those cultures. Um, there's there's more mysticism and ritual to Catholicism, which mm-hmm. leads to stuff that I would hazard to say find a tips towards superstition, at least for some practitioners. Uh, again, like the idea that something knocking three times is a mockery of the Trinity. Well, why isn't it the Trinity? Mm-hmm. I mean, why isn't that God, God knocking? And numbers are really important, especially to, to Catholicism, but like Christianity and everything else. Three, four, seven, and six. Seven being the perfect number, and therefore six is the imperfect number, and that's how you end up with 666, and like all of the, the silliness there. Three is the Trinity, and it always confused me. Um, it, it's something I didn't get a chance to like really kind of sit Lorraine down and ask about. We 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 spent most of that time talking about Ouija boards, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> we, didn't we didn't agree on that either. Um, well, what's your but, your view on that? We're gonna we're gonna get to that because we do get a lot of emails about the particular board, and we'd like to hear your your opinion on them. Somewhere there is forty five minutes of. Uh, an argument between me and Lorraine on the cutting room floor from Paranormal State. <laughs> I want that. I want to I go to there. <laughs> because I but I got her to, to agree in the end. It's a tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really, tools are in the eye. That the meaning of a tool is in the hands of the person who's used it. So a Ouija board is no better or worse than a hammer. Yeah. You can use a hammer house you can use a hammer to bash somebody's skull in the hammer itself is not the thing that does the thing the hammer is simply the tool uh in a lot of ways i i'm I'm always baffled by how people get so bent out of shape over ouija boards when they will at the same time do the exact same technique but with a k2 meter exactly thank you thank you (laughs) or a pendulum or your dowsing rods, or the little janky uh, flashlight that's set just so that like the light will blink on and off. Like all of these things, you are using as a focal point to encourage the spirits to interact with something, make something move, change the electromagnetic magnetic field, whatever. You are inviting this communication, and because Ouija boards have, in many ways, again, much like demons and three knocks been picked up by pop culture mm-hmm. by horror movies and really like kind of pushed in the popular imagination as these great evil portals to hell um especially you know the exorcist yeah exactly 1970, 1973 little, yep, yep right when it became evil because captain howdy talked to Lil reagan Something that I think a lot of paranormal investigators really need to consider is the influence of pop culture on people's expectations and also on the lens through which they interpret their experiences. Mm -hmm. How many hauntings of spooky little children running up and down the hallways in hotels existed prior to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining? Good point. Do we know? Good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. You're you're totally right because well, even like um, even to the good, like ghost hunters, right? There was there wasn't a lot of paranormal investigation teams until that came up, but they all had the same ideology as ghost yeah, hunters. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that that the pop culture aspect is bad. What I'm saying is it gives people a language. It gives them an internal mythology, whether they realize it or not. Mm-hmm. And 
it becomes easy to interpret your experience through something that's familiar. Uh, my favorite thing to kind of pound on this is black-eyed children. Oh, gosh. Hmm. Never heard about these things until it became really easy with CGI to black out the eyes in a movie and make someone look mm-hmm. really creepy. I didn't and hear... It was yeah, Michelle. Scary children. I'm right there with you because I didn't hear about Black Eyed Children doing this radio show. This radio show has been around forever. And I didn't hear about it until Photoshop really became a thing. Mm-hmm. And then I started getting the pictures. Well, that's a Black Eyed Child. And the stories that roll in and stuff like that. Because it really wasn't a thing until, what, six, seven years ago was really when it took yeah. off. Out of nowhere. Like, absolutely out of nowhere. So- I mean, on one hand, it could be the same as Slender Man, where it was intentionally created, mm-hmm. uh, where it was fabricated and then encouraged to kind of become an urban legend. Or it could be people taking actual experiences, and now they have this visceral image of a black-eyed child from a horror movie, and they don't necessarily remember that they saw it in a horror movie. It just stuck in their craw because it's it's a visceral image. It, it mm. really is creepy. And Gosh. so when you're when you're perceiving something like ghosts aren't standing in the same room with you in the way that like a human being is, uh, and when you perceive them, you're not perceiving them quite the same way as someone standing in the room. Even if your brain is telling you that that's what you're seeing, um, you're interpreting this. Uh, whether you're psychic or not, it's something that's beyond the five physical senses, but your brain is wired for those senses. Mm-hmm. So it, it does the next best thing in trying to telegraph this information to you. So it seems like you're seeing something. It seems like it's physical. And in groping for perceptions that make sense to your brain, it's very normal to draw upon uh, archetypal images like things that you like things that you've seen like on TV, on movies that you read in books. Um, it's a uh, it's an internal symbol set, um, the language of our minds. Now, some would argue that because we're all focusing like Slender Man or Black Eyed Kids, is there a chance that with all that consciousness going into that, all the energy, it creates a thought form of its own? Oh yeah, absolutely, um, and, and that's kind of the chicken and the egg really like how many of the ghosts started off as ghosts and how many of them are things that we've projected into the world but actually in in my research in demonology that's a, a big question because oh you, you've got the big names that everybody knows especially from the bible but like the deeper i i research into this and i mean i've i've gone through so many books at this point things in latin and french italian uh german where i can stumble my way through uh, there's a number of beings that like really didn't exist until somebody told a story about it, wrote a book about it. Um, Mephistopheles is probably my favorite one, um, the, the Faust myth, uh, where that demon didn't really exist until somebody s- told stories about them. And then you have later times where people are creating like full-on summoning circles, and it might as well be real at that point. Like, like I guess it gets really tricky when you start thinking about are thought forms real? Can our belief create something or shape something? Mm -hmm. Or do do we create a container that is in the shape of our expectations that something then steps into? Something that existed that... And I, I think it's sometimes a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. And at the same time, there's also column C over there where there were things that inspired the stories. Mm-hmm. I, I, I agree. I agree. It makes, you how many, it makes you wonder how many Alistair Crawley came up with, too, in his writings that are now popular. Oh. Yeah, his, uh, the Awas, the, the spirit that he spoke to that, like, had him write the Book of the Law. That's, I, I've often wondered, like, was that a projection of, of him? Is that his higher self? Was that a spirit that, like, actually appeared to him? Like, what, what was going on with that? And as with almost all channeled entities, like, I don't know that unless I were present, 
to actually witness it, to like see what was going on, I don't know that I would be able to say definitively one way or the other what what that was. Um, so I I have a question here, and I'm I'm I've asked it before, and ha- and and have gotten kind of uh, several different answers, and there there's a theory that was told to me way back when I was just you know a little little pup investigator. And um, that was because uh, what always can not confuse, but kind of frustrated me was um, when you're investigating, you're trying just to have a normal conversation and ask them, uh, you know, ask the spirits a, a random, you know, decent question, respectful question. Um, like you would never get an, you never get an answer. And that would happen over and over and over again. And and that's fine if they just don't want to, to, to talk to me or anybody else. That's definitely their decision. Um, but somebody told me that there, there are like rules when you get to the other side of what they can tell us on the, on the living side. Have you ever encountered anything like, like that before? Or is it specifically their choice on whether they want to answer a question or not? Well, I've encountered the source of that belief, and it's largely from the spiritualist movement, where they kind of extrapolated this entire structure for what spirits could and couldn't do on the other side. Uh, My personal experience, uh, ghosts especially, like human spirits, they're just people, and they don't, they're they're no different from from living people, and uh, I think it's... Uh, it's silly of us to assume that something changes in them, either for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if somebody was a dick in life, they're pretty much going to be that way on the other side. I have not encountered. Yeah. I have not encountered anything that like prevents them from communicating. What I have noticed in some cases is the person perceiving may not have the context or the ability to fully understand the message. Mm-hmm. So the closest, like, in practice that I've encountered that, like, kind of, I could see where somebody would make that conclusion, that there's there's rules or, or some, some way in which, like, they can no longer communicate the same way as us, because they, you know, they're, they're, they're communicating mostly through thought and intent, which we then interpret as language. And so there's going to be some stuff that's lost in translation. Sure. Well, what did ghosts do with their time? I mean, that's what we were joking about <laughs> in the first hour. We were, we were saying, man, it would stink to just be floating around and you kind of go everywhere you want to go. And But really, on a serious note, when, when you do become, when you do cross over, what's that like for them? Uh, I mean, there's obviously has to be a spiritual journey involved. Am I correct? It, it varies from person to person. Um the the belief system that I have found that strikes the most true with what I've both experienced and observed uh, can be found in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, they believe that there's this, this process where your, your spirit detaches from your body, and in that process, there's several points of realization that you, you get a chance to either, like, you know, move on, like, just move right on to a different level of existence, or if you've got a lot of stuff about this life that you haven't sorted out, if you haven't done your therapy, if you haven't done your internal work, if you're like really hung up about not saying goodbye to somebody, those things kind of interrupt that process and keep you here mm-hmm. so that you end up kind of obligated to work that out. Um, now, whether or not you have enough sense to do the working out is totally up to the, the individual. Um, I mean, what do ghosts do with their time? The human dead? First thing I will say is, if you've ever had that, like, lonely 3 a.m., like, you wake up, and your brain is just sort of racing, yeah. and, like, everything was bugging you in the day before, and your, it, it just, your brain won't shut up, and it, time draws out. Like, time doesn't really have any meaning while you are just lost in those thoughts, until your body tells you you have to get up and pee, mm-hmm. at which point you are more aware of time, you're locked back into time, it kind of yeah. pulls you out of that thought storm. Well, if you don't have a body to remind you that time exists, you're just alone with your thoughts. 
That does not Ugh. sound very fun at all. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's like up with some of the ones that like we call quote unquote earthbound because they're they're so they're so wound up with what they haven't sorted out that they're just they're just spinning. Mm-hmm. Um, they the, what they need is a really good therapist. <laughs> Does that why hauntings happen? In, in my opinion, yeah. Um, when it's an intelligent haunting, it, it's someone who has something unfinished business and attachment, like something that they haven't quite worked out or let go. And it can be something from the outside world, like you know they've got a grandchild that they never really got to, to see grow up, and. Uh, you know, this doesn't seem like a bad thing, but it does keep them there. Like, they hang around to, like, watch the grandchild, and they may become, you know, a guardian, a guide. They may become very involved in that person's life, and that's a very positive haunt. Or they may be somebody who, uh, actually, oh, this is this is one that I got had to investigate. This was someone who, you know, she just kind of had a, a crappy life. She ended up overdosing. There were some questions about whether or not her boyfriend helped her overdose, and she stayed in this place, this apartment that she died in, just trying, obsessing over how everybody else had it better. Mm-hmm. Until she followed a little girl home because this little girl who visited, her, her grandfather had moved into the apartment, um, she noticed that the little girl had, had the parents that she had always wished that she had. She became obsessed with the little, little girl. She wanted to become the little girl because, in her opinion, her life had sucked. She had, you know, grown up in poverty, people abused her, like, everything was crappy, so she just wanted to be this little girl, she wanted a little girl's life, um, and I had to forcibly detach her from the little girl, because she was not, she started off as, like, kind of like a friend, an invisible friend, and then got creepy clingy, because she couldn't get over her own crap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She got envious of the little girl, she wanted that life, <laughs> it wasn't fair, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Her 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 thing. Like she was wound up over how everything wasn't fair for her, and she could have had it better, and she should have had it better, and and that turned into a fairly negative haunting. Is okay, that- so uh, uh, you have a follow up because I'm nope, I'm good, man. Kind of good. Okay, so I'm I, I have a debate going with a friend of mine who's also a, an investigator. Um, and, and, and she's, uh, intuitive. She, she really likes to, um, cross people over. She fully believes that if they are here, then all they really need is the information and the tools to move on and they'll move on. My contention is that when spirits, um, or when people die in their spirit, you know, their soul detaches that they have, they have the choice of whether they want to move on or stay here. Not even so much because they have um, like unfinished business, but you know, like an old couple who, who, who died, who lived in the same home for like 40 years. And that was when they were the happiest of their entire lives. And that's just where they want to stay. Are spirits given those um, like choices? I mean, are are they say, "I, I, I know heaven wants me, but this is kind of my heaven. I just want to be in my house and they don't mean any harm or, or anything like that. But are, are, do they have that choice or is that wrong? Uh, I am all about choice. My experience and my beliefs based on those experiences, it's very much about choice. Uh, just because a human ghost is still in a space doesn't mean that they're locked there. doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. They, they may want to be there. And yes. I don't like crossing <laughs> over because I don't think it's my business uh, or my right to determine when or where somebody should be. Mm-hmm. You know, most of the investigations that I've done, you know, not, not the ones that make it to TV because usually those are extreme instances, but the vast majority, I go and I am basically a mediator between the living people in the space and their invisible roommates who don't pay bills, but mm-hmm. who have as space as anybody else and i just find a way to get everybody to learn to live with one another i mean often that's just a matter of like setting boundaries of like you know don't mess with the kids don't mess with the cats or the the dog yeah stuff like that (laughs) 
don't don't physically touch people because most people find that incredibly creepy. Um, that's one of my rules generally. Like don't don't I would prefer that you not actually physically touch me because my brain just has a hard time dealing with that. Like <laughs> mm-hmm. don't weird. don't pound on the wall when you're doing an interview. Yeah, little don't, things. Don't yeah seriously like that that was a little bit. Don't stand <laughs> next to the bed or canoodling because that's creepy. And if you want to know what like go, you're very bored. Some of them do that. Yep. Yeah, I I have heard about <laughs> that before. And but what you're saying is free will doesn't end at death. We still retain that. Absolutely. And uh, I I really encourage people who are well intentioned and want to try to cross things over. Consider that it might not be your right to tell them when it's time. Like, only they can determine that. Like, by all means, give them, like, what you believe to be the tools. Like, if you think someone doesn't realize that they're dead and you can communicate with them and, like, basically give them therapy and say, hey, you know, it's, you, you had a hard life, this thing's happened, like, have a conversation with them, but leave the choice to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, a lot of... I live in the state where Marianne Lentowski lives and practices. Uh, she's the one that like inspired the whole Ghost Whisperer thing. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, she and I really strongly disagree on the whole sending things into the light. Uh, because I I don't think that I or anybody else have, have the right. Like, what kind of hubris would it be for me to say that I could go into a house and determine whether or not someone is ready to move on to whatever their next stage is. Mm-hmm. Like, and that I have the power to like basically boot them into it. Yeah, what gives you that authority to yeah, show I, up and dictate their life or their afterlife in that case? I mean, I wouldn't do it to a regular person. And to me, spirits, whether they're human or not, I approach them as if they were just a person that I was interacting with. Like, they are a being. They, if they are intelligent, they have every right to be treated as a thinking, rational being with feelings that I need to understand before I ask them to do something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, I know you do a lot of mediumistic work. We've been talking a lot about that last few minutes. But let's just say you have a loved one that has passed away. And you want to communicate. I is it true that everyone's a little psychic? Are we all psychic? Is there tools that we can employ to own that ability? I think almost everyone has a little bit of psychic ability, but in the same way that some people are blind or deaf, there mm-hmm. are a few people who don't have the facility, or it's so... Uh, it's not like you can have corrected lenses for your third eye <laughs> to, to make it kind of funny. But... That doesn't mean that they can't hear you, even if you can't hear them, can't perceive them. So what I strongly suggest, there's a, there's a couple of things that I, um, in, in, I, I'm clergy too, and I do a lot of ministering um, for end of life and, and post end of life. Like that's kind of the main part of my, my calling. One thing I recommend to people, write a letter. Write a letter and uh, burn it or, or put it on the grave. Uh, and symbolically give it to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, on one hand, it's it's good therapy. It's good stuff for you to get those thoughts out and to communicate it. But from a theological perspective, um, they they hear that you are giving them a message. Uh, also, yeah. if we go back to like some of the most ancient practices, dreams and dreaming. Dreams are probably the most common documented places where paranormal experiences specifically spirit communication happens even among people who don't think of themselves as psychic so if you have lost a loved one and you have a dream where they are communicating with you with they where they talk with you take that for a communication yes there's every chance that that is your psyche uh filling in this gap this hole that is empty and aching in your life. And there's also every chance that they are communicating with you. Um, yeah. yeah. Dreams of spirit communication were some of the most consistently documented and reported paranormal experiences 
in the Society for Psychical Research. Like there are reams of these, many mm -hmm. of which have information that is verifiable information that the person dreaming couldn't have known. So dreams aren't a bad place to communicate, yeah. even if you don't think of psychic. Exactly. I, I hate to say it, but our hour's up. Uh, wow, did that ever <laughs> fly right by? But Michelle, can you tell Always people does. how they can get a hold of you, your website, that kind of stuff? Uh, MichelleBelanger.com is the website, and Belanger is Belanger if you're in the United States. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube under... Uh, this one's a mouthful. It's Seth Anakim. It's an old internet handle. It's S E T H A N I K E E M. But that's the ID on all of those. So if you find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, that's the ID to poke around. I'm pretty sure I come up in the first five pages if you just Google Michelle and Vampire. Like, <laughs> so we got to have you back on so we can go in that area too. I'd love to have you back on the show. We just haven't covered enough ground with you. And said, so love to have you back on. And we got to get out of your mic. We just got to go. Everybody have a great week. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Exactly. Take care of each other and stay love home. each other. And stay home if you can. After Hours AM is a production of Midwest Radio Productions. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And please visit www.americas-most-haunted.com.